Good morning or afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us on our webinar today. I'm Genevieve Johnson. I'm the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, and today we have a webinar for you on scenario planning for conservation, um, addressing uncertainties through a collaborative approach. Um, Barry Fradkin is a senior analyst from GeoAdaptive is with us today, and he has applied his background in environmental science, hydrology, and geospatial analysis to a lot of scenario planning projects across the U.S. and Latin America, and their company has actually worked with several LCCs as well, so they're familiar with our model and some of the work that we're trying to do. He's also helped facilitate straight stakeholder workshops in Alaska, urban development and habitat displacement in Florida, um, and evaluate human and economic risks associated with natural hazards. Um, their team has worked uh, very well with numerous clients and again with other LCCs to identify spatial patterns, visualize solutions on landscapes with all of these partners so that we can come to better conclusions and decision making uh, for conservation. Most of you um, heard Matt a little bit earlier when he mentioned the chat box today. Um, if you didn't, if you hover on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little toolbar pop up and there's two little blobs to the left and that is our chat box. Everybody has been muted for the webinar, so if you have any questions, technical difficulties as we go through, please put them in the chat box and we'll try to get that monitored for you and those questions answered throughout the web very presents. Um, the other thing that we want to remind everybody is that the webinars are recorded and we will be placing those on our YouTube channel um, so that if you want to share that information with folks later they can go back and look at it there. Um, so with that I'll turn it over to Barry. Great, thank you Genevieve. Um, glad to be here and thanks everyone for attending the webinar. Um, Excited to tell you a little bit about what our company does and give you a few examples of some projects where we've applied scenarios to different conservation issues. So as, as Genevieve mentioned, the title of my talk is Scenario Planning for Conservation, Addressing Uncertainties Through a Collaborative Approach. And while not all of our scenario projects are completely collaborative, uh, we try as much as possible to include stakeholder participation as much as we can. Uh, so I'll start just by telling you a little bit about the company I work for and my own background. I'll give you a little bit of an overview on scenario planning, and then I have three main project examples to discuss with you with a few snapshots of um, different phases of the project. And then just some general suggestions on how to implement a scenarios approach in case some of you decide to try this with your own organizations. A little bit about GeoAdaptive. Uh, we were born as a research group out of Harvard and MIT. The principal of our company, Juan Carlos Vargas, uh, was teaching in the DUSP department, Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And his research group uh, was working on some conservation issues, actually. And uh, one of the participants in the call today, Steve Traxler, was kind enough to join us when we broke off. And he was one of our first clients. So uh, we're glad to still be working with him and looking forward to it again in the future. Um, in terms of our approach, we try to use a systems-based analysis. We use a lot of geodesign-based approaches, looking at uh, data, spatial analysis, as well as a lot of planning concepts, both within the urban, economic, and conservation realms. Uh, it's important to us to understand spatial structure, looking at the scale that different processes occur, relationships of different elements of the landscape and also just how people and the environment are interacting with each other. And the ultimate goal of our work is to help improve decision making within organizations, looking at how funding is, is uh, allocated and looking at how can people plan better for the future based on all the different uncertainties and changes in administrations and funding that may be going on. Our team is composed of a variety of different backgrounds. My background is actually um, environmental science with a focus on hydrologic modeling and GIS. I've also worked for regional planning agencies doing more urban focused work and since I've been with the company here 
I've been working on economic development, urban growth projections, uh, land use analysis, and hazard modeling to help support projects in the U.S. and primarily in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. So this map shows a, a wide range of different projects that we've worked on. Some of those in Europe and Asia were before the company was formed but completed by uh, the principal here. I've worked on many of the ones in Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'll just show you the locations of the few that we're going to talk about today, specifically one in Florida, looking at the Florida Keys, one on the north slope of Alaska, and one looking at the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. Uh, this was funny, actually. Steve had forwarded me an article this morning, and I thought this was a, a good sort of summary, although there's one thing I'd like to change in it. But essentially, scenario planning helps managers incorporate climate change into their natural resource decision making through a structured what-if process of identifying key uncertainties and potential impacts and responses. The only term I would change there is climate change, because it's not only letting you incorporate climate change. There's so many other factors, development, um, economic trends, political regimes, all, all sorts of things. And the, the citation for this paper is at the bottom there. It's a recently published uh, article in a professional journal. So I wanted to go through uh, some of the basics regarding scenario planning. First, uh, some key terms that everyone should be aware of. Drivers of change is one that we use a lot. Also, driving forces or just drivers. These are different factors that collectively influence the trajectory, magnitude, and speed of potential landscape changes. Uncertainty is pretty obvious, but it's different characteristics of systems that are more difficult to predict. So there's some degree of variability, and we don't know necessarily what their future state will be. Trends are slightly more predictable. Um, you know, we can see that there's a trend of increasing development or climate change, for example, but we might not know the overall magnitude or there's a uh, some uncertainty related to that trend. Plausibility is really important with scenarios because while you can come up with a whole slew of different outcomes or future alternatives, there's only some that might actually occur within the realm of possibility. So we try to make sure our scenarios are always plausible within reason, of course. Finally, just the scenario process itself. It's a comprehensive approach helps to identify and evaluate different alternatives for a region in light of the driving forces and the uncertainties, and is used to assess the implications of those futures on natural and socioeconomic resources within that landscape. Uh, so a little bit of the conceptual background. Um, when, my, when my boss, Juan Carlos, was in school, he was studying with Carl Steinitz, who really helped to pioneer the geodesign approach, which is heavily based on scenarios so these are a couple of uh, uh, graphics that he developed in his older papers, just looking at how the history of a region, some of the basic facts and constants are interacting with a bunch of different driving forces. And depending on the direction or the trend of those driving forces, there's so many different outcomes that might occur. Um, you know, and we try to avoid this combinatorial explosion where you could combine every different variation with every other variation and just focus on the most useful scenarios. So picking some scenarios that help to bracket the low or the high end of what could occur with a landscape. So an extreme climate scenario, an extreme development scenario versus a very low development or low climate change scenario. Also just looking at the overall process for developing scenarios, there's typically a, a group of stakeholders that are solicited for input. We have a research team that's compiling all the necessary data and also connect, conducting the analysis based on the scenario architecture that gets developed by the stakeholders. We have a series of different process models, and then we have impact evaluation models that help to determine how each scenario will affect the landscape and some of the key variables that are of concern to the stakeholders. Um, some basic principles of scenario planning. It should be participatory, ideally, with as many different groups as, as you can involve within your budget and other resources. We usually try to include people at the federal, the state, and the local level. The scenarios team helps to facilitate the participatory process. We're collecting feedback from people. We're helping to manage the discussion. 
and we're also synthesizing the outputs of each workshop that we put together in order to help develop these comprehensive scenarios and make sure that they're reflecting a wide range of alternatives. Simulation modeling itself should look at multiple futures. We usually target three. Uh, it depends on the situation. There are cases where we've come up with 10 or more scenarios and then through a further filtering process narrowed those down to the most critical ones for decision making. Scenarios are a learning tool, so it's not always about the outcome of the scenario, but also the process of developing it and seeing what people find important or what people consider to be the most critical driving forces. Uh, it's a process of simulation, not prediction. We don't know exactly what will happen but we can get a better idea of what the possible outcomes will be based on the scenarios. And scenarios are basically consist of a package of multiple variables, but we want to control that number of variables so that we're not coming up with too many that it's hard to actually model the scenario. And you can see in the graphic on the right, this is an example from one of the Florida projects we worked on where there were four main variables which each had different levels of intensity, so low, medium, and high climate change, based on official projections, different population projections, different assumptions regarding land use and water planning, so business as usual versus proactive, and different levels of financial resources for conservation, so lower or higher funding levels. And we looked at multiple different combinations of each of those levels to see which scenarios would be the most useful for planning in the future. Finally, looking at conservation consequences. So how do the outcomes of these scenarios in terms of the level of development, the level of funding affect where conservation should be targeted or what the priorities should be for decision makers? And trying to find resilient strategies that will work across a range of different scenarios so that should things not go the way that we expect them to, we have a backup plan or we have, uh, we have contingencies in place that will basically cover that alternative. The first example I'd like to go over is the Florida Keys Marine Adaptation Planning Project. This was uh, for the Florida Keys region and working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, specifically their Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, as well as with funding from NOAA. The main objectives of this project were generating a comprehensive set of future-oriented scenarios, simulating a subset of those scenarios, assessing the likely consequences, and arriving at an appropriate set of adaptation measures based on those consequences. Uh, just so you know, this is one that I, I wasn't as heavily involved with, but I have um, had the opportunity to look at the results of it. And so uh, if you have more specific questions after the webinar, I'm happy to put you in touch with others who work more closely on the project and might be able to give you more details. Uh, just to look at some of the variables that were considered in this project, on the biophysical side, we looked at sea level rise through 2060, ocean acidification, sea surface temperature. On the socioeconomic side, we looked at the human response to sea level rise, different marine resources like habitat, fisheries, both commercial and recreational. And finally, on the management side, we looked at marine resources as well as general legislation and policies and how those might change in the future. And you can see for three different climate scenarios, different approaches to dealing with these changes. And so we developed scenarios that would address those different combinations here. This was done through a series of three workshops. And rather than opening it up to the general public, we focused on expert stakeholder input. We brought in people from uh, federal agencies, including USGS, Fish and Wildlife, and the U.S. Navy, as well as NOAA and the National Park Service. Uh, we had some nonprofits, including Nature Conservancy and National Audubon, as well as state agencies and local government. And we had breakout group sessions where people worked through a series of activities, sketching on maps, discussing some of the key variables, and seeing how those would fit together in a plausible way. So here's one of the maps that was developed through the analysis of one of the workshops. And so basically there were three different indicator species that were evaluated. The Goliath grouper, which is a large fish, spiny lobster, and the loggerhead turtle. We looked at the habitat areas and how those different variables, the fisheries, the level of tourism, 
sea level rise and surface, sea surface temperature would affect the habitats and the species that we're focused on. A lot of this information was digitized from maps that were sketched during the workshop, and then we overlaid this with other geographic data to see what the implications of those would be on the habitats. So you can see, for example, sea surface temperature. Uh, we can look at where the position of existing conservation areas are relative to mangrove areas, relative to state boundaries. Uh, so the next project is focusing on North Slope of Alaska. This was one that we completed on behalf of the North Slope Science Initiative, and we partnered with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, this one was a lot more complicated, just as you can see from the North Slope Science Initiative's logo, there's so many different state, federal agencies, public and private sector, uh, includes some representatives from the oil and gas industry, uh, as well as Alaska Natives and their corporations that are heavily involved in the oil and gas sector. And really the focus of this project was to look at research and monitoring needs for all the organizations that are members of the North Slope Science Initiative. We engaged a wide range of stakeholders in these workshops and we encouraged cooperative exploration of each of the topics, which could be challenging in some cases because there were such different priorities for some of these organizations. Some were focused on conservation, some wanted to expand development and see restrictions removed on some of these critical habitats. And just to point out that the North Slope of Alaska is basically everything north of the Brooks Range. So this includes the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, uh, the National Petroleum Re Reserves, and a lot of other state and federal conservation lands, as well as native Alaska lands. Uh, finally, the, the focal question of this project is, what is the future of energy development, resource extraction, and associated support activities on the North Slope and adjacent seas through 2040? And so it's interesting because the focus really was on how development would be affecting their research priorities. And normally we would try to have the stakeholders help develop this focal question, but because of the organization and the need to focus on a specific topic as defined by their steering committee, this was defined for us up front and we worked within the bounds of this and had to make sure that everything we did was focused in on that, that specific question. So the process began with uh, background knowledge and review. We developed a series of fact sheets about each of the key topics from climate change to oil and gas development to new technologies, um, political changes and economic realities of the region, including how the region gets funded from the state based on oil and gas revenues. Uh, we also distributed these fact sheets to participants prior to the meetings so that everyone would be on the same page, in addition to reviewing some of those key facts during the first workshop so that even if people hadn't reviewed the fact sheets, we knew that they were getting at least the same base level of knowledge about each of the topic areas. The next, uh, the first workshop was focused on identifying and developing the scenarios. One of the things that was really interesting about this project was how sensitive people were about words. We couldn't use the word scenario development because development had an implication that you know there might be future growth or expansion of the oil and gas industry, so we tried to use identification. And another example of that is we couldn't use the word impact. We had to say implication because impact included a value judgment. And because of the diverse range of stakeholders that we included in this, we had to try to avoid offending anybody and make sure everyone's opinions were included in the process. Um, so during this process of scenario identification, we had multiple activities. We did a, a driver prioritization to narrow down the list of topics we would consider. We looked at how those drivers were linked together, and then we used those key drivers to develop a scenario architecture with a low, medium, and high scenario, indicating the level of the overall level of development and how each of the other variables would correspond to that. We also had the participants develop some short storylines and present a few of those to the larger group. And then we began having people sketch out where some of the implications of those scenarios would be occurring, primarily where specific development might occur, um, where land use changes would happen, as well as how any of the more political or economic implications would be affecting the landscape. 
we've, we had everyone do a ranking process at the end of the workshop to select the final top three scenarios, one each for low, medium, and high, and those advanced to the next workshop where they were considered further. That next workshop looked at how those different levels of development had implications on assistance, hunting, whaling, uh, changes in permafrost, and other geographic and landscape issues that were very critical up there. And every change on the North Slope really has a cascading effect on the hydrology, on, on the native population and their livelihoods. So it's a very interesting uh, process to go through. And in the final workshop, we looked at research and monitoring needs based on those implications. We had experts work together to identify the areas that would be most affected and also where they would need to refocus their research and data collection efforts. Here's just a couple snapshots of the workshop. We had a lot of activities with breakout groups. We had people ranking drivers, trying to group them together. And then we put everyone's work on display, and gave everyone a chance to look at, you know, how did other people develop their scenarios? What did they consider to be the most important implications? And then based on that, selecting the most representative scenarios, the most plausible scenarios to be evaluated further. This is an example of one of the maps where they sketched out some of the developments that might occur under one of the oil and gas scenarios. And this is a result of one of the spatial analyses we did. So we actually overlaid the results of multiple groups to see where there was overlap and where there was some agreement between those groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also evaluated the research and monitoring needs. One, one thing that's important to note about the organization of the groups is that during the first two workshops, we actually tried to bring in people with very different backgrounds into each breakout group. Whereas in the final workshop with the research and monitoring needs focus, we grouped together people by their area of expertise. So people with a hydrology background were together, people with a wildlife biology background were together, et cetera. Uh, final project, oh, sorry, I didn't update the location here. This would be the OSA Costa Rica. And the client here was the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, which was really also a partner for us to help a lot in the development of the project. The main objectives of this were a synthetic analysis of all the issues currently going on, identifying and fulfilling gaps in the existing data, case studies to address timely issues that are going on in the region, specifically development, agriculture expansion, and climate change. Also, interactive co-development with stakeholders of the scenarios, and finally designing strategic pathways towards sustainable development. This looks at some of the key issues, and there was a lot more spatial modeling involved in this, uh, where we looked at a variety of factors and did weighted overlays, looking at how those factors combined to create areas of less or more attractiveness. And I apologize for the Spanish. I didn't have time to do a translation on these slides. <clears throat> and we also looked at different projections for the amount of development growth, the amount of agricultural growth, and we looked at these six elements as the scenarios. Trend scenario was looking at how things would change without any update to their enforcement or regulation. Rapid growth would be even less enforcement and regulation than was currently going on. And finally, proactive would be uh, better enforcement of regulations and maybe even more more sustainable regulations to control the growth in the region. Um, a few different analyses we did as part of this project. One was looking at different types of ecosystem services and how they overlap with each other in order to identify areas of the region where there are more combinations of ecosystem services being provided, some where there are less and it might be more suitable for development. We also looked at the urban development projections as well as the agriculture projections to see which areas would be most impacted by those in the future. And we did a visual preference survey with uh, local citizens. We had a lot of different snapshots of different landscapes within the region. We had people rank them and basically use that to identify the, the areas and the types of landscapes that people valued the most, as well as looking at the types of development people did not appreciate. Um, finally, I'll give you some suggestions about 
how to implement how to implement a scenarios approach based on my experiences and just some general principles. First of all, defining that focal question up front is really important, making sure that we can always make sure all the work is going back to addressing that focal question and ideally including the stakeholders in the development of that question so there's more buy-in. And the participatory process itself, working with a team that is familiar with developing these different types of participatory activities, knowing how to avoid pitfalls and how to help resolve conflicts. There's sometimes people who get really upset in these workshops if their point of view isn't being well represented or they feel like they're not having their suggestions incorporated into the scenario design. So there's different approaches to help deal with that. Also just making sure you get all the right people in the room, not only the the resource managers, but the people who use the resources, the general public, uh, people who help develop the policies and regulations related to those resources, people who fund, of course, the conservation. And third, most importantly, especially in Alaska, is hiring a qualified facilitator, somebody with vast knowledge of the local issues, um, and just trained in facilitation and knowing how to deal with some of these issues. <coughs> On the time horizon, it's important to pick one that's far enough out that there's some uncertainty, but you have a, a general idea of the direction things are going, but also not so far out that it's not relevant for your ongoing planning. On the spatial analysis side, it's important to integrate as much of the best data that's available, first of all, to capitalize on the work that's been done previously and also identifying areas where there's not enough data or some general assumptions have to be made so that you can prioritize future data collection or uh, development efforts. Leaving some room for interpretation, so not trying to delineate the exact boundary of the habitat, but letting people sketch general areas to facilitate a better discussion and not focus as much on the details. Finally, dedicating resources to visualization and mapping you can talk all day, but as you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, and if you have a map that people can easily understand and interpret, it's really critical to getting across the implications of these different scenarios and facilitating the discussion as well. Finally, on the communication strategy, making sure that participants are well informed throughout the process, people know when the workshops will be happening, considering when there are key events, for example, in Alaska during the summer, there's uh, a lot of hunting and fishing that goes on and field work versus in the winter people are stuck inside. They're usually more free to participate in a workshop. <clears throat> Sharing the results of your project, project and process online, making them interactive if possible. Uh, we've developed story maps for some of our work, letting people sort of walk through the process and zoom in and out on the maps to see the results, <clears throat> as well as providing data portals to download some of the key outputs of the analysis. And finally, just recognizing the value in the scenarios process. Really, the interaction among the participants was one of the things that people loved the most in the Alaska workshops. They met a lot of people they wouldn't normally have talked to. They were able to identify other studies that they weren't aware of and find potential ways to collaborate in the future. So that was a really uh, big benefit of that. So thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions and uh, try to provide you a little more detail about our work. Great. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, I, I guess I'll start with a question. Um, in terms of looking or being able to, to address uncertainty, how do you communicate that um, through scenario planning with the participants? Um, so part of it, for example, with climate change, uh, you know, there's a lot of projections and there's error bars is one easy way to just show people that there's a lot of uncertainty the further out you get into the future. Um, showing the fact that there are multiple types of projections, including you know, population growth projections or uh, even looking at the past and, and the ways people have predicted growth might occur and how it actually turned out. So a lot of it is um, sharing the data, using the best data available so that people trust the analysis that you're presenting and also um, you know, getting people to talk about it and point out other uncertainties that you might not have even been aware of. <clears throat>
Thank you. Um, so folks, if you have any questions at all, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. And then while we wait for that, Barry, I have another question. I'm wondering if you could maybe give us um, an example of how the scenario planning process maybe changed an outcome or changed a decision or is integrated into a decision? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll use Alaska as an example. Um, there were definitely some situations where people were expecting continued growth of the oil and gas sector, uh, but one of the scenarios was basically the oil and gas sector completely shutting down and infrastructure being dismantled and how would uh, you know, the conservation sector deal with that. And um, even during the course of the project, which was developed over a couple of years, we went from, you know, oil boom to diving oil prices, and they did basically abandon oil and gas development, at least for the time being, on the North Slope. Um, it's very costly for them, and they've got a lot of risks of oil spills and things like that. So in terms of how they're allocating their funding to develop uh, research and collect data up there, I think the process itself highlighted a lot of data gaps, um, specifically like detailed land cover data, detailed elevation data, where we could see that during the development of the process. The best land cover data they have is from five different years all sort of mosaic together, and so it's hard to evaluate land cover change when you don't have a consistent data set, and part of the problem is, of course, cloud cover up there, but um, elevation is really critical, too, and being able to look in detail at where elevations are changing due to oil and gas development or due to climate change, and using that as a way to help focus the research efforts. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do that real quick and allow folks to um, unmute yourself um, for questions. But in the meantime, Barry, we did have some come in. Um, the first question is: Can you? Sorry, sorry I was I was uh, trying to answer Roy's question, but I think my oh. audio got disconnected somehow. Yes, I think so. So go ahead and answer Roy's question. Sure. Yeah. So let me step back. Um, I was talking about uh, in Alaska specifically. The workshops were three days each, and that was partly due to the fact that it was hard to get people to leave their work for that long, uh, or for longer than that. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have a whole week to really develop some of the concepts and have people work through the, the, the activities in a leisurely way, but um, generally the first day was more about introducing the topics, getting people to start talking about some of the issues, and then the second day was really developing the maps and storylines, whereas the third day was more about the wrap-up and getting people to select from among the different scenarios and implications that were developed. Great, thank you. Um, and so I think it maybe in terms of how long some of those workshops are, um, it might depend on specifically what we're trying to get out of it. Um, the next question from Lacey is from start to finish. How long, on average, does the scenario-based planning process take, uh, basically, initial contract to completion of deliverable? Sure. Um, so the, the process itself really varies. Uh, Alaska was more drawn out because of the seasonal field work and uh, just time to deal with funding issues and you know feedback from, from the clients. So that one took 
close to two and a half years, I would say. Um, there have been some that have been developed in under a year, but you really need a solid year, including the prep time, the workshops, and then analysis between workshops to generate results that feed into the next part of the process. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, when you discuss limiting your variables, like sea level rise, sea temperature, et cetera, how did you choose those? And were the variables identified by your team or during the workshops? Sure, uh, so that, that varies somewhat as well. Ideally, we would want the full process to be participatory. We would want the stakeholders to be brainstorming all the different variables and then narrowing those down. Um, that was true for the most part in Alaska, although we did have sort of a subset that was defined by the client, so we didn't open it up to a, an unlimited number of variables, but we did have options for people to add one or two at each phase of the process. Great, thank you. Um, other questions from the folks on the line? If you have them, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. And while some folks are typing, um, Mary, I, guess I'll have, I have a, another question. When you mention having enough resources dedicated to doing some of the visualization and, and actual um, analysis work, I guess, uh, what, how would you describe making sure that folks have enough resources available? How would you quantify that? Um, I mean, it, it sort of depends on the topic and the size of the region, but it, it could be something as simple as having one of your own analysts dedicated for a few weeks to really compiling all the data and doing some quality control on it to make sure that nothing critical is missing. It's also about, uh, you know, giving time to have a review process and a revision process for some of the visualizations and the workshop products. So for example, with the workshop activities we developed, we flew in our client from Alaska and we actually did a mock workshop for a few days in the office so that we could run through the activities, figure out what wasn't working or what needed to be adjusted, going back the next day, having a revised version of that activity, and then finally, you know, putting it all together, printing the materials, and having time to, you know, really set up the workshop room and, and develop the, uh, the analysis after the workshop is really critical. The visualizations are important just in terms of the communication strategy, being able to have some aesthetically appealing products, things that are eye-catching, as well as, uh, you know, just being able to share the results on a public platform. Great, thank you. Um, how many team members do you recommend bringing with you when facilitating workshops? And do you think there's a ratio of facilitators to participants that you try to work toward? Sure, yeah. That one, um, it also depends on the size of the workshop and the types of participants you, you have involved. So if you are working with the general public, obviously you're going to need more facilitators. Um, for our Alaska workshops, we generally had five or six breakout groups. We tried to avoid having more than seven or eight people in each breakout group just because at, after that point there's really too many voices and it's hard for anyone to get their ideas across. Um, for each breakout group, we just we did have one facilitator at that table and then there was one floating facilitator, one or two, that would be able to answer some more difficult questions or help if this uh, conflict got too out of hand for the uh, table facilitator to deal with. Great. Thank you. Um, have you had to deal with participants who disagreed strongly with a particular scenario or its implications? Um, and if so, how did you handle that? Yeah, that's definitely come up. Um, in general, we part of the process of having these range of scenarios and the bracketing scenarios is to try to cover everyone's opinion of what might be the future. Um, in some cases, it's just about making sure that their, their opinion is acknowledged. You know, we're taking note of your, of your opinion and we understand your concern. We'll 
we'll do more research into that and making sure that, you know, at the next meeting that we bring that up again, that, you know, this person pointed out this topic and we looked into that. Um, the general consensus in the literature is X and, you know, um, we understand this could be a possibility and it's something to keep in mind. Great, thank you. Um, if there's other questions, go ahead and, and type them in. And while we wait for that, um, Barry, I'm wondering, um, the Desert OC is an international um, cooperative. We have partners in both Mexico and the U.S. Um, in your experience of, of working with not only the language barriers, but also um, maybe working with data coming from different languages and, and different systems, um, different, obviously, cultural values, could you give us um, maybe some examples of how you brought those folks together and a little bit of the challenges, but maybe some of the outcomes that you thought were more beneficial? Sure. Um, well, yeah, that's, we, we definitely have projects in other languages, but typically they don't have two languages at the same time. Um, but definitely there, there was a little bit of that in Alaska where the Alaskan natives have their own terms for things, and as much as we could, we would try to include those in, in the slides or in the materials that we passed out. Uh, we didn't do full translation of any of the materials because it was understood that most people did have fluency with English. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously we'd recommend having a translator on hand at any workshop, having the materials in both languages so that, you know, any background information that's shared is accessible to everybody. And then being able to collect the feedback and, uh, you know, share the results of that feedback with both language speakers. Another thing that um, we're currently doing in our landscape conservation design process is selecting indicators um, for ecosystems that are of concern to our partners. Um, these are mostly like biological um, indicators. And I'm wondering if there's any lessons learned you might share with us about how the selection of those indicators um, might be influenced by what you can and can't do with um, scenario planning? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, from our approach, being more spatially oriented, it really helps to, to have indicators that have a spatial component. Um, even if it's just point data, you know, there's things that can be done like interpolation or uh, re-aggregating to a different geography. Uh, for example, in some of the Florida work we've done, um, where we had coarser population data, we used a, a process that was able to reallocate that based on land cover type. Um, but definitely considering, you know, what are the driving forces, what are the key variables, and then what data do you have, and whether the scales are compatible between those different data sets. So making sure that you list any assumptions or any sort of limitations that might be associated with the scale of the data. Um, and also, we, we develop a lot of proxy data where we need to, and we try to use um, the best information available, or at least to, you know, cover a wide range of possibilities so that um, if there is uncertainty about the quality of the data, at least we're considering a lower or a higher end of that uh, driver. Um, folks on the line, any additional questions? I'll give you just a minute or two to type them in. 
think of uh, other questions later, you're welcome to shoot me an email. Um, you know, we're happy to set up a time to talk about it further if you're thinking about doing a scenarios process. My email is just bradkin, my last name, at geoadapted.com. Thanks, Barry. I'll type that in the chat box in a second just so people can see it. Um, another question that's come up is um, in terms of some of the clients that you've had, are folks asking for scenario development to help influence um, changes in decision making across yeah. landscape? Definitely. Um, one, one specific project I didn't get to talk about today was in Cabo del Este, which is in Baja, California. And it's an area that has a very sensitive desert landscape, and it's directly adjacent to uh, a marine protected area. And there's been multiple attempts to develop tourism resorts over there. So uh, one of the groups that contracted us was basically trying to fight the tourism and show what the impacts would be on that environment. Um, so one of the main points of that analysis was the fact that, you know, if you're developing a resort for 100 people, there's a multiplier effect where you need, you know, 10 times that many people to help support the resort when you include all the people who work there, all the people that need to uh, set up shop nearby to support all those workers and their families. So it has a much bigger effect than just the footprint of the resort itself, not to mention the water consumption and, you know, fertilizer and the effects that that have on the marine environment. So yeah, there's there's been some uh, projects like that where we're trying to influence a specific decision and ultimately that project didn't get funded, but there may be future attempts. Great. Um, and then another question that popped up, um, which you might have just answered a little bit, but maybe you have some other examples, is um, besides the processes that you just described, can you say anything about how the scenarios were applied? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess one, one other example, some of the projects that we've done in Florida, which Steve Traxer is going to talk about, I think, with you guys in a few weeks, um, those have focused on prioritizing conservation funding. And I know that, I don't know that a specific um, land purchase has been directed based on those scenarios, but it's definitely helped to inform which areas are more critical for habitat connectivity, um, which areas might need to be focused on because they're more likely to be developed in the next 20 or 30 years, as well as looking at you know, where sea level rise is going to start to displacing these habitats and causing different species to shift further inland. Great, well, thank you again. Um, I will ch place, just make sure I get your, it's your email correct, Barry, it's B. I, I can type it in actually, I think. I can. Oh, okay. And then that way, folks, if you guys have any other questions, um, you can, of course, send them directly to Barry. Um, but we will also, again, have this recording available online. Um, so if you share it with folks as new questions come up, um, you'll be able to gather those as well. Um, with that, I'll give folks just another minute to ask any questions. All right. Well, thank you again, Barry, for the presentation today. Um, this is part of one of many webinars that we're doing related to landscape conservation design and all of its components. And scenario planning in particular has been of increased interest to um, not only ourselves, but all of the partners in desert landscape conservation cooperatives. So um, it was a great presentation, very informative. Thank you so much for your time and um, all the discussion and 
and questions that you were able to answer. Um, thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, again, we'll make this video available on our Desert LCC YouTube channel uh, shortly. And if you have any follow-up questions, please just let us know. Thanks and have a great day. Great, thank you.